In this topic, we're going to discuss in vitro fertilization. So by the end of this topic, you should be able to answer the questions, what are the causes of infertility? What is the IVF procedure? Why is the success of IVF in older women lower? What are some complications of IVF? And what are the ethical implications of IVF? So the causes of infertility is just a little bit of extra. Now, infertility is a term usually applied to couples who have been unable to conceive a child, having tried for a year or more to do so. And the reasons for infertility in women include failure to produce or release an oocyte. This is often a result of an imbalance in the hormones that control the menstrual cycle. A number of medical conditions can also lead to infertility, for example, polycystic ovarian syndrome, make it difficult for the ovaries to produce oocytes. Thyroid problems, some cancers and AIDS also prevent ovulation. Medicines and drugs, some cancer drugs may interfere with ovulation. And age. The fertility of women decreases during their mid-30s and continues to do so until menopause. Infertility in men may be due to abnormal semen, which is the most common cause of male infertility. This includes a low sperm count or decreased sperm motility. An autoimmune reaction can also cause the sperm to be destroyed. So this is when the immune system destroys the sperm. Medical conditions, for example, cystic fibrosis and chlamydia infections, can cause the vast deferens to become blocked. And reduced testosterone can lead to the sperm not being produced. Medicines and drugs, cancer drugs and anabolic steroids reduce sperm production. Right, let's have a look at in vitro fertilization. This is the fertilization of an oocyte by a sperm in a glass dish outside of the reproductive system. The success of this technique depends on the medium that the sperm, ova and embryo are in. So this must have a pH, osmotic potential, and ionic concentration that is similar to the blood, and must also contain the patient's serum as a source of protein and other macromolecules. Okay, let's have a look at the IVF procedure. Firstly, you have ovarian stimulation. So a fertility drug, for example, gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, is administered to the female. This stimulates the development of multiple follicles within the ovaries. A dose of human chorionic gonadotrophin is given to complete the oocyte development in these follicles. And ultrasound, oh sorry, ultrasound images monitor the follicle development. The second step is oocyte retrieval, so a fine tube is inserted through the vaginal wall and this is guided by ultrasound images, so the needle is directed to the ovary. The oocyte retrieval is done under anesthesia. Step 3 is semen collection, so this is collected from the man and inactive sperm is removed in a process called sperm washing. The sperm are placed in a nutrient liquid to ensure that they are active. Fertilization, so the motile sperm are added to a series of dishes, each containing a single oocyte. They are incubated together for about three days. Step five is selection. So after three days, the dishes are inspected to find out which oocytes have been fertilized. These can be identified because they would have divided 
to form a group of six to eight cells. The best embryos are then selected. Step six is embryo transfer. So these selected embryos are transferred into the uterus, placing a tube in the vagina, or sorry, in the vagina through the cervix. And we call this embryo transfer. The number of embryos transferred depends on factors, for example, the woman's age and the number of embryos available. Two embryos is fairly typical as this gives a reasonable chance of at least one developing further while avoiding the possibility of multiple births. Now, human coronic gonadotrophin is administered to the mother to maintain the endometrium and to help ensure that the embryo is not shed from the uterus lining. Progesterone may also be given to maintain the endometrium. So after about two weeks, a pregnancy test is done. And the success of pregnancy using IVF is usually about 20 to 30%. Now, if the sperm count is low, then you can take a single sperm and inject it directly into the ovum. This is called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So why is the success less likely in older women? While oocytes are less viable, there may be chromosome abnormalities of oocytes. Ovulation is less likely. Reproductive hormones are secreted in small quantities and are less effective. Implantation of the embryo is less likely. There's also a higher risk of miscarriage. Okay, let's think of what are some complications of IVF. Well, multiple births because you have several embryos being transferred. Now, multiple births are linked to miscarriages, premature births, and a death of the newborn. Psychological stress, which is related with infertility. So the IVF procedure and financial implications also play a huge role in psychological stress. Birth defects may occur, although this risk is not supported by studies. So there's another term, gamete, gamete intrafallopian transfer. So what is it? GIFT. This is when the eggs are removed from the ovary and placed with the sperm in the oviduct. So as you can see in this diagram, the egg and sperm are injected back in the, into the fallopian tube. This increases the chances of fertilization, but the process will occur in vivo, not in vitro. Can you think of some ethical implications of IVF. Well, the first is bypassing natural methods using technology. Is it money well spent, given that the success rate is relatively low, especially for older women? What happens to the embryos that are not implanted? And at what point can an embryo be considered to have human rights? Should the cells of the unused embryos be used for stem cell research, which could help to find cures for a range of disabling diseases?
who decides when IVF is appropriate, especially because it's an expensive procedure? Does it leave other children without family because people who might have adopted them now have children of their own? Should single mothers be allowed IVF? Is a child without its father at a disadvantage? What about surrogate mothers and the legal implications with this? And then finally, is the selection of suitable oocytes and sperm for IVF acceptable? Would it be right for the parents to select the sex or other features of their child? And that concludes our lesson. The end.